Welcome, everybody, to our first edition of the what must be the most exciting <laughs> YouTube video series ever. Watch your professor grade. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to do is go through six different homework submissions. Uh, these are all anonymized, so you, you shouldn't be able to see who has done it. Uh, and I'm going to point out some of the mistakes that I'm seeing. You'll get to see what I'm thinking as I read through these proofs. I'll try to uh, tell you exactly what's going on in my mind. So uh, on the right-hand side, uh, you'll see that uh, I have a little section over uh, here for issues that I'm going to spot, and I'll try to type them up as we go. That way, when you get your individual homework assignment back and you see the number one at the bottom, you just know, oh, that comes from list uh, item number one from the, the homework issues. In fact, uh, maybe I'll even just get rid of the one here because we could just make a running list of homework issues. All right, well, let's get let's get started here. Uh, so, the first thing I'm going to do is read through the exercise, make sure I understand what the problem is, and uh, make sure all the notation is fine. So, let's see, let S, T, and U be sets, let G, okay, a function from S to T, H is a function also from S to T, and F is a function from T to U. Okay, and let them be functions. Prove that F is in, if F is injective, and the composition of F with G is equal to the composition of F with H, then G equals H and A. Ah, so, there is a missing period here, right? So even though this is math, we still care about punctuation. Uh, and as soon as I see this mistake, I start looking through the rest of the document, and I notice I'm not seeing periods anyway, anywhere, right? So we're going to want periods here. If this is part of a sentence, and actually we'll have more to say about this, we would want a period here. So our first issue is use correct punctuation, including punctuation, or let's say periods, and commas at the end of, um, uh, let's call them indented uh, equations. Okay, so indented meaning, right, we have these on their own line. In LaTeX, you might call this display mode. Okay, so if you have a an equation which is the end of your sentence, you still need to put a period there. Okay, so this is a very common mistake. Okay, fine. Uh, we, get, we get to the proof. By definition of composite. Okay, so I assume here you're probably talking about composition of functions, uh, but good rule of thumb, you do not have to use the phrase definition of. If it's the definition, then I already know it, and I can figure out it comes from the definition. So don't cite the definition. <laughs> Okay, so people like to use the phrase by the definition of, by definition of, right? Don't cite the definition. You can just say what is true based on the definition. So, for example, here we would just get rid of this bit. Okay, uh, so this would be the beginning of a sentence, and you say, okay, for all x, ah, well, where are the x coming from? That's one question. Number two, notice that the x doesn't look the same as the x here. Okay, so the x down here is in math mode, the x up here is not. So we need to make sure we stay in math mode. Okay, so sometimes you'll see this little comment on the side. This is a very easy thing to mix up when you first start. You know, if you just have one single letter, right, in the middle of your sentence, you kind of forget to put the dollar signs around it to put it into math mode. That's something usually I have to figure out like when I go through and edit it a second or third time. Like, oh shoot, I didn't I didn't do all my X's. So let's come over here and let's say make sure uh, variables in text are put into math mode. Okay. All right, so in this case, since I know the X is going to be going into the G, then this X has to be in the domain of G, which is S. So we would want to say here for all X in S. Okay. And then, well, we need a connector, because what we don't want to do is, is just speak without like the intermediate words that are needed. So in this case, you could say something like we have. So for all X and X, 
all X and S comma we have, and now here we go. Now, there's already going to be an issue here because on the left-hand side, you have F compose G, and on the right-hand side, you have F of G of X. And saying that these are equal is what I call a type problem because what type is a thing is F compose G? This is a function. And what type of thing is F compose G of X? Well, when you put X into G, you take something in S and it comes out in T, then you apply F and that gives you an element of U. This is some element of U, right? F compose G is a function from uh, S to U. These are not the same type of things, so it doesn't make any sense to talk about them being equal. Okay, so we need to check that equal objects have the same type. Okay, fine. Uh, so what would I do to make this a correct statement? Well, what we really want is say f of g of x is the same as f compose g applied to the element x. Okay, f compose g is a function, but x is an element. You apply the function to the element and you'll get out an element. So this will make sense. This is now again an element of u. Okay, uh, let's see. So we have f compose g equals f of g of x, and then the same sort of thing would happen here with the f composed h, right? We'd want to have this of x. And uh, and now you're claiming that these two things are equal, but it's not obvious why you're saying they're equal. Okay, so we need a little more to it. Now, before I get into how we, we, we solve that, let me talk about something else here. So I call this stacked equations. And we want to avoid this because what you're really doing is when you stack these equations, you are making an ambiguous statement. Are you saying that one of these things implies the other, or that in this case, I think you might be saying two of them implies another, but there's another argument that's totally missing, namely this bit right here. Um, or are you saying these are three independently true statements? Which if you were, for example, looking at systems of linear equations, you know, something like, you know, 3x plus 2y equals 6 and uh, 4x minus 6y equals 7, you're not saying that the top one implies the second one. You're saying these are two simultaneously true statements. So we need to distinguish that. And so the way we do it is this is what we mean when we stack equations. We have simultaneously true statements. Now I'll show you what we can do that looks kind of like stacking, but which is not. So uh, in our list though, we're gonna have number five, avoid stacked equations. Okay, so the argument we're trying to make is that f of g of x is what? Is equal to f of h of x? Um, no. Oh, right, right. We, we, okay. So we know that this is always true, in fact, right? Because F composed G equals F composed H. So that's really where we're trying to get to, right? Is, okay, we want to write down this statement. So what we could say is since F composed G equals F composed H for all X and X, we have f of g of x equals f composed g applied to x. And now I can use this equality here. And I say, ah, this is equal to f composed h applied to x, which is equal to f of h of x. Okay. So I can put this on one line with a chain of equalities which, that starts with what I want and finishes with the other thing that I want. And now because it's a chain of equalities, they're all equal. Now, if you had wanted to uh, to stack this, because you, you I don't really like things being on one line. Well, in this case, I, I wouldn't, I just wouldn't stack it. But if you wanted to, the way you would do it is this. So we'll have f of g of x equals 
f compose g of x equals, and notice there's nothing on the left-hand side here, f composed h of x equals f of h of x. And by not having anything on the left-hand side, it is implicit that I am just going from this to that, right? From this line to the next line. And, and that means that f composed g of x is equal to f composed h of x. So there's no ambiguity of, oh, am I saying simultaneously, you know, oh, all these things are true. I'm, I'm literally just saying, follow the logic. Left to right to down to down, right? And they're all equal one at a time. Okay. Now, once we get that f of g of x equals f of h of x, now we want to conclude that, well, g equals h, but really that g of x equals h of x. Okay. And the explanation that we need, because here you see we've only written the only way this is possible. Why? What are you, what's going on in your mind? Why do you know that this would imply g of x equals h of x? And what's going on in your mind, I, I hope, is that f is injective, all right? So as, why well, I could say since, but I already used since up here, so I use a different, different word. As f is injective, g of x equals h of x, okay? Now from the beginning, wait, we'd said this was for all x and x. And so we have now stated that g of x equals h of x for all x and x. Therefore, g equals h. Okay. Uh, one thing I'll um, uh, note here, the g of x equals h of x is also, that needs to be in math mode. Okay, so if I'm uh, grading one of the, the others, I might just write a 3 somewhere on here, because that's make sure variables and text are put into math mode. Okay, or, or I'll just write the math with a circle, which is, that might, might be faster for me, whichever one I like. Okay, so that's our, our first one, right? And okay, so you'll make these uh, modifications and you'll resubmit it and we can uh, get a better grade going. Okay, so let's go to the next one. All right, so I start here and, ah, so something is happening, right? You see with the formatting. Uh, if we go back to the previous one, when we wanted something on its own line, it was really nicely indented. And and here, it's just going off onto the next line. Um, and there's a lot of line breaks. In fact, that's what I'm, the first thing I'm seeing here is, is nothing is looking very good, right? Like, these are all indented right here, and they shouldn't be. Um, uh, this thing, like, everything is kind of on its own line. So what we're going to add here to the list, right in paragraph form. Okay, so that means you're not building new uh, paragraphs every single line, right? It should just be one continuous paragraph, at least as long as these are short problems, which which these are. Um, so no, uh, no new lines after each sentence. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, few things going on in here. Uh, it really looks like the A and B here are not in the same format. It makes me wonder if the author has been using dollar signs after almost every you know, symbol. Uh, it's, it's not clear to me. Actually, this one looks okay, right? This B looks okay, but this A doesn't. Um, so something like this, two things. Number one, you should be entirely in dollar signs, right? So you'd say C equals A plus B equals backslash curly brace, A plus B. Now, let's talk about this thing right here. This is the such that line in set builder notation. And the way you want to do that is by writing backslash MID. And what that's going to do for you is create extra spacing, right? Extra spacing between the left and the right sides. Here it's really crammed together. We don't want that. Okay, and then we would have A in A, comma, B in B, that's a B, okay, and we close that off. Okay, now, if you want this on its own line, that's fine, you can do that, but you should be using an equation environment. So what we'll do is begin equation, and then you put an asterisk, and then we'll do end equation, 
and an asterisk, and then we can put this down inside there. Uh, and you don't need to use dollar signs in that case. In fact, don't use dollar signs in that case. Okay. The reason for the asterisks is if you don't put those in, it's going to auto number your equation, which is not inherently bad, but you shouldn't auto number unless you really plan on referring to things later. And probably in this length of a proof, you don't need that. Okay. Okay. So uh, once again, we're missing periods. Okay. Now let's jump in. Uh, what are we trying to do here, right? We have a sum of sets. And we want to prove that the supremum of the sum is the sum of the suprema. So, uh, looks like the author wants to shorten things up a little bit. Let the supremum equal A. Ooh, right? Like, there's supposed to be an equal sign, right? So, do edit your work. Um, and the supremum equals C plus D. I don't know where C plus D... Why? Okay, why would we know that C and D could be elements from A and B. Like this is already assuming like way too much. Okay, so this is not a typographical mistake now. Okay, this bit is a, is a real math error. Okay. Um, and this is probably gonna cause all sorts of, of issues here. Uh, this is probably a good time to say by relabeling the supremum to be a little letter A and the supremum of B to be a little letter B in a proof that's gonna be this short, it kind of feels unnecessary, right? Like, why are we shortening things up that much when the proof is already going to be short? It takes longer to tell us that we're going to use nicknames than to just finish the proof. So we're gonna add a seventh one on here, avoid unnecessary, unnecessary, oops, necessary nicknames. <laughs> Cut. Fine. Um, again, we have a math mode issue here. All right. And, okay, we have a since then construction. So this is something I mentioned in class, and you're going to hear me saying this all the time. Okay. Uh, and, and this is not something that the rest of the world necessarily agrees with me on, but, uh, I see, I get to teach the class, so I get to indoctrinate the way you, the way I want. Avoid since then. Okay. If you're going to use then, it should use, almost always come with an if, right? Unless the then is a, like a temporal one. Like, oh, then he went to the store. Okay. But when we're talking about um, implications, okay, so since it follows that, or we have, okay, so things like that. Okay. Avoid the then here. Then is a code word. It ties with the if code word. Right? That way you always know if I see an if, there's going to be a then. When I see a then, there was going to be an if. And then I know everything between the if and the then is my hypothesis, and everything after the then is my conclusion. Okay, uh, let's see. Ooh, this is kind of interesting, right? C is not greater than A. I guess that's okay. Of course, we still have math problems here with all these letters. Okay, um, therefore... Yeah. So, okay. So this one is going to have to be redone for a variety of reasons. One of which is, I think the math right from the start is, is making an error, which is probably going to be irreparable. Uh, you'll, you'll just have to scrap this. You don't know what, you can't necessarily write the supremum as a sum of two elements from A and B. Like there's no reason to know that. Um, and then, yeah, we're going to want to fix all this uh, latex jazz. Okay. Let's go to number three. All right, so in this one, we have two real numbers, and we want to prove this variation on the triangle inequality. Okay, statement looks good. Um, ah, so here we're, it looks like maybe, maybe we're breaking it up into cases, right? So you're going to look at negative real numbers. Uh, oop, looks like we have a little punctuation issue. Uh, that's fine. If the absolute value of A equals negative A. Ah, so... I'm guessing what you mean to be saying is that when a is negative, then the absolute value of a will equal negative a, right? I'm hoping that's what you mean to say, at least. Uh, but when you've assumed a is negative, then that is true. And so you don't want to say if 
about something which you already know to be true. Okay, so number nine, don't if something or suppose for that matter that people do that. Oh, so suppose a like you said, let a be negative. Suppose a was negative. Well, no, no, you just said it was negative. There's no supposition anymore. All right. So don't if or suppose that which is already true. All right. So uh, you're saying absolute value of a is equal to negative a. Uh, and let me see. There's a no, that, that's my cursor. I was kind of worried there was an absolute value. Then the absolute value of a plus b is equal to the negative of a plus b. So I, what I suspect is that you are meaning this not for just this particular a, but for all possible negative numbers. Uh, in which case, since we know a and b are negative, their sum is negative, and so the absolute value will be the negative of their their sum. Uh, and that would be true. So I think the easier way to say that is uh, if a and b are negative numbers, just kill this, then uh, maybe we could add one more thing. Then a plus b is less than zero and absolute value of a plus b equals the negative of a plus b. Fine. Uh, we recall the identity. Ah, you know, you don't have to recall that. That's You're just adding zero, right? Like so... Let's just get rid of that, because um, you're just going to write it again here. And I don't think anybody could reasonably be confused by what's happening when you say a equals a minus b plus b. Okay, uh, so here again, we have this, uh, this is mistake number five. We don't stack equations, okay? We need to put explanations, okay? So include explanations, or even just, like, connecting transition phrases or connecting transition phrases okay nobody can read this but you have to listen okay um, now let's see what the math is going on here so you let a you say okay a is equal to that uh, and then you just write a is less than or equal to this so yeah I mean I guess that's a true statement if it's equal to that then it's certainly less than or equal to that and then you said absolute value of a is less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values. So that that takes a little bit of argument here, right? Like why why would that be? Um, we already have the triangle inequality, which says if you take the absolute value of a sum, then this is less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values. Okay. And so in our case, it looks like you want this, right? So if I replace a plus b with the absolute value of a minus b plus b, then this would be less than or equal to the absolute value of a minus b plus the absolute value of b. And then we already know that this is equal to a, and therefore via the triangle inequality, a absolute value of a is less than or equal to, okay, what you have here. Okay, so what that means is that when we write this up, we actually want to use the triangle inequality, so we need to cite that. And in fact, you can combine this all really into one bit, all right? We have absolute value of a equals the absolute value of a minus b plus b and this is less than or equal to the absolute value of a minus b plus the absolute value of b and then we can say where the oops where the inequality follows from the triangle inequality or in fact the way i would probably want to do it I, I prefer to actually uh, whoops, let me delete all that jazz. Oh, it's not deleting very quickly today. Okay, I'm just going to leave that there for now. I would actually say by the triangle inequality, and don't really use a triangle, right? Use the word. By the triangle inequality, we have that equals that equals that, right? Less than or equal to that. Okay, thus, 
And now you, you're just going to subtract. So you have absolute value of A minus the absolute value of B is less than or equal to the absolute value of A minus B. Okay. Um, and now, it you say, therefore, the statement is true for negative real numbers. So it's actually not really clear to me how you're getting from absolute value of A minus the absolute value of B is less than or equal to the absolute value of A minus B to the statement that we have, which has another set of absolute values around it. All right. It's also not really clear how you're using that A and B are negative anywhere here. Right? You, you've established in the first line using the negativity something about the absolute value of A plus B, but that's not what's being used over here. So I think this <coughs> requires more explanation. Right, So that's my more explanation needed line. Okay, so you have to say a little something more. Uh, now, you continue on, you say, uh, uh, let A and B be positive or non-negative real numbers, then their absolute value is equal to A. Uh, then you say the absolute value of A minus B. Well, okay, so here, this is what you're trying to prove. And then it looks like, oh, maybe you're saying drop the absolute value. So... Yeah, don't, this is basically you supposing what you want to prove, okay? So don't suppose the conclusion, <laughs> okay? You don't know that the conclusion is true, so don't start with it, okay? So that'll be number 10 here. Don't suppose the conclusion. Okay, so what if we started from the uh, bottom here. So it's certainly the case that A minus B is less than or equal to A minus B. It's not obvious that the absolute value of A minus B is less than or equal to the absolute value of A minus B. So for example, if I do A equals, um, let's say A equals 2 and B equals 5, then a minus B equals negative 3, but the absolute value of A minus B equals 3, and, well, 3 is definitely not less than or equal to negative 3. All right, so I think there's a little something more that needs to be gone here. I'm not really sure what the argument is, is supposed to be. Um, so this is going to have to be reworked, okay? So rework this. Okay, so... Next one now. Ah, all right. So we're back into this uh, number six, right? We need to write in paragraph form. Okay, so all this stuff is missing things. Uh, also, you'll notice here there's missing periods everywhere, right? So that's uh, I think that was number one, punctuation. All right, let's, let's double check that. Uh, yeah, correct punctuation. Um, uh, math mode. Right, so I'm just going to write that over here. All this stuff, right? F, G has to be in math mode. Uh, yeah, composition shouldn't be uh, uppercased here. Uh, avoid starting our sentences with then, right? That's uh, number eight. Okay, we. It's part of number eight, right? Like so, I said avoid since then, but also um, only use then. after and if, unless then refers to time. Um, okay, so, and, and when here say, then we have, and you say, well, yeah, see, that is time, the next conclusion we have, right, next in time, but that's, now you mean it follows from the previous thing. Okay, uh, so let's, Let's look at the math. F and G are injective functions. Okay, the composition of these functions is this. Yeah, I know that. Um, you probably don't have to say that line. Um, so you can just go here. Suppose, okay, we're trying to prove it's injective. That's right. So suppose G composed F equals A, or of A is equal to G composed F of B for 
okay, we can just get rid of some arbitrary, okay? When you write down for A, B, and C, that's that's fine. Except for the C part, uh, A and B, where are they coming from? <laughs> well, they have to be inputs that go into F, which means they have to come from the domain of F. So this needs to be an A. Uh, this, by the way, suggests that maybe little a and little b are, are not good letters, okay? Because to me, little a would come from a, that's fine, but little b would come from capital B, and that's probably not the uh, the thing you want in your reader's mind, okay? So um, make good choices for the names of your variables that don't create unnecessary confusion. All right, you, you say I have a, a set B and an element B. Man, most of the time that element B should be an element of big B, right? <laughs> okay, uh, then we have, uh, yeah, okay, so, um, so you could just make this into uh, if this is true, then this is true, right? Just make it one sentence. Uh, since, instead of saying we know, just since G is injective, all right? So, avoid um, extra phrases like we know when you don't need them, right? When they do not... Uh, add to the reader's understanding. Okay, we have as kind of a special case because that's you like that's telling you it's a it's a sign, right? Oh, here comes the conclusion of the sentence. Okay, so since G is injective, okay, so this is a a thing we 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 would want a comma here, and then then after the comma, we don't really want to start with math symbols. So this is a, another sort of general thing here, right? So avoid starting sentences or new clauses within a sentence. So when you uh, have a comma, okay, then very often what's coming next is going to be a new clause in the sentence. So avoid starting sentences or new clauses within a sentence with math symbols, okay? So this is this is a, a courtesy to the reader. It's very difficult sometimes uh, when you do that. So this is where you'd say, right, we have g of a equals g of b. Ah, well, that's actually not something we have actually at this point. So you have that f of g of a equals f of g of b. But that doesn't tell you that g of a equals g of b until you first establish that, right? We don't know that. And in fact, you have your proof backward, right? So reverse the order. You know that F is injective. And so since F is injective, right? We have up here F of G of A equals F of G of B. So since F is injective and the image of two elements is the same under F, then the elements have to be the same. So we have, notice I don't just immediately write it, g of a equals g of b, right? Now, since g is injective, I could say uh, injective, okay, I could say we have again, or maybe I'll mix it up, it follows that a equals b. Okay, thus we conclude that the composition of two injective functions is injective. Okay, that's fine. Um, uh, and again, right, like we don't want to have all these on their their own line. Uh, that's okay here because I think we already marked that. Yeah, that was number six. Okay. Whoops. Let's save. Let's go to the next one. Ah, so... We're going to use the AMGM inequality to prove that the perimeter of a rectangle is always at least four times the square root of the area of the rectangle, and that for a fixed perimeter, the maximum area of a rectangle occurs when the rectangle is a square. Ah, what a beautiful problem. So define a rectangle with width x and height y. Great. Let the perimeter and area be represented by P 
equals 2x plus 2y, and a equals xy, respectively. Okay, this is not bad here. Um, so first, by uh, maybe I would say the amgm inequality, we have, okay, so again, this is the uh, don't stack equations bit. Uh, so we have x plus y over 2 is greater than or equal to the square root of x times y. Okay, um, it's probably good uh, at some point here uh, to mention that x and y are, I mean, they're even going to be, yeah, I mean, they're, they're going to be greater than zero, right, if it's a real rectangle, because that's one of the hypotheses, right, for the AMGM inequality. Okay, so then you just want a little connective tissue in between here, right, even just a, a word. So you have this, period, therefore, this would be true. Yep. Okay. Um, now, something that's going on here is that you are actually doing the logic out of order. All right. So I should, whenever I have a string of equalities or inequalities, I should be able to see why from left to right each one is true. So here I can definitely see that P over 2 over 2 equals p over 4. However, why is it that p over 4 is greater than or equal to the square root of a? That's not as immediately obvious, right? Because, for example, if I went back up to what we had up above, oh, x plus y, well, that's not p. And that's a 2, that's not a 4. And, okay, well, the square root of a, that makes sense, but, like, this doesn't connect. So the right way to do this is actually to put the p over 4 on the left-hand side. And now I'd say, okay, well, clearly p over 4 equals p over 2 over 2. I buy that. And p over 2 over 2, well, okay, the over 2 is that. And p over 2, ah, that's right. 2x plus 2y over 2 is x plus y. And that is, by this, what we did up above, greater than or equal to the square root of a. Okay? So we want to try to write our chains of equalities in a logical order, right? So that each one you can see the implication. Okay, so here comes number 14. Uh, write chains of equalities so that uh, consecutive, consecutive terms are logically connected. Okay, what I mean by this, you can see the, the, the argument without having to pass through something that came before it. Okay, multiplying each side by 4. Uh, oops, there's no comma needed here, results in P greater than or equal uh, to 4 root A. In fact, here the multiplying each side, this is actually kind of awkward the way it was originally written. Each side of what? The inequality? The equality? But here, the way we've rewritten it, you actually have kind of a beginning and an end, and it's kind of obvious now that those are the sides, right? That's the flank. Um, but you could avoid all that by just, say, multiplying by 4. And uh, and now, yeah, like there's no no question about what you mean. Okay. Uh, P is at least 4 times the square root of A. Hence, the perimeter of a rectangle is always at least 4 times the square root of the area of the rectangle. Okay. All right. Now, you've moved on to a new paragraph, and this is fine. Okay. There's, there's two very clear parts to this result. Putting a new paragraph in now makes makes sense. Fine, now let P be fixed. By the results above, we have P over 4 squared is greater than or equal to A. Ah, so what you've done is a little bit of algebra, right, without telling me all the steps. And you know what? When we're in an upper division math class and it, they're not complicated algebraic steps, I'm okay with that, right? That feels pretty good. I can see pretty quickly from here that if I divide by 4 and square it, I'll get this uh, inequality. So this is okay. However, the two sides of the inequality are only equal if all the sides of the rectangle are equal. Uh, why is that, right? So what what is telling you that? All right. So this either is going to require me to think, right, hard about why this might be true, which I don't want to do, or you could have gone right back to the beginning and when you cited the amgm inequality you could have said down here with equality 
only when x equals y, all right? Or exactly when is even better, right? Exactly when. Because it's true, when x equals y, you get equality, and only when x equals y do you get equality. And that would have explained, right? So this explains that line. <laughs> this explains that. There you go. All right, but generally, this is a, this is a very good, a very good solution. All right, last one coming up here. Fine. Uh, okay, so we've seen this one before. Uh, op, you see, there's that little mid problem again. Okay. Uh, this is, you can see here, the C equals A plus B, yada, yada, has been centered on the line using an equation environment. So that's, that's really good. Uh, ah, and here you can see an example now, all right, where it's actually been numbered. So when I see this, the first thing I want to do is look and see, does it get used? And, oh, it does get used. Okay, excellent, right? So that's a good example of using the, the capabilities of LaTeX in the right way. All right, let A and B be non-empty bounded subsets of R. All right, so this was written roughly, I don't know, an inch and a half up above. So you do not need to repeat the hypotheses in your formal proof. So that's going to be number 15. Don't repeat the hypotheses at the start of your proof. Okay, so uh, so we can just get rid of these. Oh, yeah, in fact, this, all of this actually is, uh, it can be gone. Now, you might say, oh, but if I get rid of this, then uh, doesn't the one go away? Well, you could always just move it up here, and then you got it. All right. Uh, we want to show this. Yeah, I know, because it was just said, prove that. So let's get rid of that, too. All right. By the axiom of completeness, we know that A and B must have a suprema. Um, actually, because there's two of them, you'd say must have suprema. Uh, yeah, and actually, in some sense, right, like the, uh, the already the statement here is a, assuming that A and B have it. So you probably can ignore this line as well. Okay, fine. What's next? Suppose L is an element of A and K is an element of B. Hey, I can do that because A and B are non-empty. Such that the supremum of A is equal to L. Ah, ah. Okay, so this is a mathematical mistake now. All right. The suprema don't have to be elements of A or B. So, for example, if you take the set 0, 1, the soup of this set is 1. But 1 is not in this set. Okay? So, that's going to be a problem. Now, let's see if uh, using equation 1. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, this is this is what you're trying to... Yeah, so, okay. So, your next line is you're saying, okay then c which okay this is already complicated because c is a set so this is a type problem and this is a number so it doesn't make any sense to say c equals little l plus k all right remember c is a set of elements of this form now if you just said the soup of c is equal to that okay that could make some sense uh, at least it's something you can try to show is true in fact it's what you're trying to show is true uh since l and k are both are the suprema both sets and L plus K is the biggest element sum that A plus B can be. Okay, A plus B is a set, right? So it doesn't make sense to say the biggest sum that A plus B can be. It's it, it's not a number, right? It's a, it's a set. Okay, um, I think there's some conceptual issues going on here that need to be uh, worked out. Um, okay, down here at the bottom, you can see we're running into the paragraph problem. So that was our, uh, was that uh, number uh, six? Okay, that's your paragraph problem. Okay, so this one is going to want to be mathematically reworked, okay, to fix the conceptual errors. So rework. Okay, very good. All right, well, we've been doing this for about 45 minutes. That's, that's quite a long time, uh, but we notice we're able to hit uh, like 15 you know, big things are going to show up. And if you can avoid those 15 things for the following week, it's going to make it a lot harder for me to start picking your stuff apart. 
All right. I hope this helps. Have a wonderful day.